going to Siberia in January is never a good idea. It was minus 45 degrees in Novosibirsk. But as soon as we met up with my Russian colleagues and they pulled a tooth out of their pockets, I knew it was worth the trip. I saw this tooth and I said, okay, the genetics is right. This is not a modern human, neither a Neanderthal. It was so clear. It was a huge, massive tooth with very large splayed roots. From Novosibirsk, it's in about 8 to 10 hour drive to Denisova Cave. The first 700 kilometers is a bit more than four hours, while the last 100 kilometers is another four to five. We drive along the last 100 kilometers is along the Anui River, a small uh, tributary of the Ob. The area is beautiful. Most North Americans compare it to Oregon or southern Washington state in, with the landscape. The Altai Mountains have wide valleys, uh, are strongly forested, and beautiful rivers. The most important sites of the Altai, Denisova Cave and a second cave, Okladnikov Cave, where we found Neanderthal remains before, are both along the Anui River. Of course, the people in the Paleolithic and the Old Stone Age also lived in there or preferred to live in areas where they had enough water to drink. The roads are pretty bad. In some places, you really have to drive through the riverbeds because the gravel in the river is much more stable than the swamps next to them. But the Russian minibuses that we use, the UAS, uh, and the Russian trucks are up for any kind of road. Slight problems with the cars are a constant part of our lives in the Altai, whether it's a flat tire or a broken off accelerator. Amazingly, our truck drivers have more or less a second truck in the back of the truck so they can repair everything, whether it's welding back the accelerator or putting in new seats, changing the rear axle, and so on. The Nisova Cave itself is about 12 meters above the level of the river. It has a rather wide entrance, uh, about 8 meters wide and 4 meters high. Um, it's not just one entrance, it's uh, practically it's three entrances. The main entrance, the so-called south gallery next to it, and there's also a chimney at the top. All these entrances come together in the central chamber where most of the excavations took place. The excavation started in 1983 in the central chamber where uh, our colleagues excavated an about three by three meter pit to a depth of, I think, seven meters. It's very clear in the stratigraphy that there's two distinct components. On the top, we have deposits from the last 10,000 years from the Holocene that are strongly laminated and uh, different colored and mostly consist of goat droppings. On the bottom, we have uh, brownish, yellowish, orange cave loam deposits that started maybe 200,000 years ago and uh, cover from 200,000 years to about 20,000 years. The stratigraphy is very complex in the lower part because in caves you have uh, lots of different processes. You can have water flowing through the cave, moving part of the deposits, unearthing some bones and stone tools, and redepositing them somewhere else in the cave. So it's rather complex, and you have to be very careful. It's never completely clear whether things found in the same layer really belong together or not. At least you can't assume that. These days, the excavations concentrate on the so-called eastern gallery that we see here, a rather narrow, about two and a half meter wide and six meter long uh, small chamber that goes into the mountain from the main chamber. Also here you see in the back an orange to black deposit and on top of that the multi-layered Holocene goat droppings and below the Pleistocene that we're interested in. The finds that made Denisova Cave one of the most interesting uh, sites in Northern Asia, or probably the most interesting site in Northern Asia, come here from the East Gallery from layer 11, a layer that we date to between 50,000 and 15,000 years ago. The excavations uh, proceed very carefully. You see here wooden blocks on which the excavators step so as to not to destroy anything in the deposits. Everything that is excavated using small tools is removed from the cave. Uh, all the sediment is put into buckets, brought down to the river, and washed through uh, sieves to recover even the smallest remains. The position of every object found in the cave during the excavation is recorded in three dimensions. For two dimensions, we use the metal wires that delimit the square meters. And for the third dimension, for the height, we use a nivellier. Sasha here is just removing his rod for measuring the height of the objects. The work at the excavation is mostly done by kids from the surrounding villages and towns who come here in the summer holidays to earn some money and have some fun. So they excavate in the cave and mostly spend the afternoon playing volleyball outside. 
the accommodation at the site is uh, actually luxurious. Our colleagues built a camp that they use both for conferences, for workshops, but also they rent out some of the houses for tourists. You have small block houses always for two people with a common bathroom, and there's a large kitchen area with a dining room that sits about 30 people. The human occupation of the Altai started possibly up to 800,000 years ago, as evidenced by the site of Karama, uh, a few kilometers from Denisova. These are mostly river deposits, but in these river deposits there are some unquestionable um, stone tools um, that could really date up to 800,000 years ago and are really the first evidence for human habitation in this region, actually even for, for all of northern Asia. This is the oldest evidence for human habitation, but the dating is still slightly problematic. Other sites that are excavated around here are, for example, Ustkan Cave, about 100 kilometers from Denisova, that is probably the best example of a, really a living cave. Many of the caves in the Altai have a very strong component of bones brought in by carnivores, hyenas, uh, cave lions, also cave bears. While Ustkan Cave seems to have been mostly occupied by humans, most of the bones we find in there were brought in by the humans. The topography of this site is also um, rather clear evidence for it being a, a living site. It fits very well. It's about 50 meters above the river with a great view over a huge valley that probably served as a migration route for horses and other herbivores that these people hunted. Most of the material that we find in these caves, besides the animal bones, are stone tools. Um, people in the Paleolithic produced their stones from silex, um, stones very rich in, in silicate. Um, these stones fracture with very sharp edges, allowing you to produce uh, very good stone tools. As can be seen here with this uh, side scraper, they are still very sharp even after 50,000 years. The material in layer 11 of the Nisova cave is produced from very different raw materials and the, the people also produce very different tools. This diversity is, is interesting. But as we have this problem that we are not completely sure whether everything in this layer is really contemporaneous. Um, when I'm at the Nisova cave or in general also in Novosibirsk, a lot of my a lot of my time consists of going through bags and bags and bags of tiny bone fragments trying to determine whether there are any human remains in there. Some of these fragments are tiny. The sieving recovers everything that's bigger than about uh, three to five millimeters. And of course, many of these fragments, it's impossible to tell whether they are human or not. But sometimes you find something that does look human. Last year in August, I was lucky. I found a little fragment of a tooth that to me looked like a human. The day after, we found uh, the other three quarters of this tooth, and then I thought, this can't be human. It's far too huge. It's far too massive. It looks more like a cave bear or something. Today, after some DNA studies and more detailed morphological studies, we know that it actually is a human. The shiny, partly pink thing in the left is this, is this tooth fragment. As you can see, every fragment recovered in the cave is also labeled, gets its own individual number, which is one of the reasons why there is much more people working outside the cave during the excavation than in the cave. Anthropologists today don't only work directly on the objects, we also work uh, with virtual copies of our objects. To digitize them, here in Leipzig we put them into a micro-CT, a high-resolution computer tomograph. The resolution of our machine can go up to five uh, microns. When I first saw this tooth, it was clear to me this is something special. It has a huge bulging uh, crown, very massive roots that are pretty short but very thick and very strongly splayed. This looks very much unlike than what you see in both Neanderthals and modern humans. In white here, or like the, the brighter <laughs> yellowish color, is the enamel in this case, and in brown you see the dentine underneath it. What is especially interesting with teeth normally is to look at the thickness of the enamel or the thinness of the enamel. A few years ago, colleagues of mine also here from Leipzig showed that Neanderthals have much thinner enamel than modern humans do, or most fossil humans do. Besides the thin enamel, what is also interesting with the Denisova tooth is the huge pulp cavity inside the root and the crown, which made a lot of room for both for nerves and, and blood vessels going in there. We also like to look at the so-called animal dentine junction at the surface of the dentine below the enamel. Using the CT scans, it's possible to artificially remove the enamel and only look at the dentine surface. 
The genetic results showed us that these Denisovans were unlike Neanderthals and unlike modern humans, but were more closely related to Neanderthals than they were related to us. We know Neanderthals since more than 150 years now, um, so we know a lot about how they looked, how they lived. The Denisovans we only know since about a year, so they are still a mystery for us.